Okay, now that we've looked at memory and attention, we're going to spend our time now looking at perception. And perception, there are so many different senses. We have five major senses, but we are just going to look at three of them. Vision, audio, and our sense of touch, or haptics. And by visual perception, we mean, for example, uh, not just visual perception, but perception in general, meaning that we take information from our sensory stores and we try to construct meaning from them. So we're going to transfer the information from our sensory store and put it into working memory. And during working memory, we use our visual uh, spatial sketch pad to construct meaning from it. Right? And normally sighted people perceive pretty much stable environments that are both 3D and colorful. And there are many ways in which we try to take all of these disparate images and try to construct constancies in these same dimensions. So for example, on the left hand side you see a red car by night and one by day. And even though these are very different images in terms of the frequency of the light uh, that we perceive, we think of both of these cars as red because we know what things look like under different illuminations. And therefore, we can think of this as the same car, even though the wavelengths are different. Okay? When we violate these constancy principles, we get surprising illusions. So for the fact that we perceive a 3D environment, uh, that we have some notion of what corners look like in three dimensions, uh, that's why when we look at this Mueller liar illusion, where the arrows have the same shaft length, right, the length from here to here, is the same length from here to here. They in fact look a bit different to us because the arrows in this case are facing inwards and the arrows in this case are facing outwards, stretching the, the information out, the, the shaft out. Okay? And uh, when we have these types of illusions, they make us uh, have some difficulty in constructing the proper meaning for them when we look at them. So for example, the Necker cube is an example of this, right? You could perceive this in uh, two different ways of a cube uh, depending on which vertices you place in the foreground and which you place in the background. And most people when they're looking at the Necker cube their um, working memory tries to make sense of this and they'll see one version of the Necker cube and then just looking at it, uh, glancing at it again, they'll see the other version of it pop out. So um, this flipping comes from the fact that you can construct more than one type of meaning from this cube. Okay, visual perception is also the case um, that we're very much tuned to uh, motion and human likeliness. So for example, this example again due to Alan Kay, uh, looks like it's okay because you have a lady whose image is upside down, you recognize that as a face, and you might uh, stare at this a little bit more and recognize that there are some changes and particularities that have been done to this face. So it's been photo edited, her mouth has been flipped upside down and her eyes have been flipped upside down and that looks okay. But uh, surprisingly when you actually flip this upside uh, image, uh, this upside down image right side up, many people get very scared. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because if you look at this, uh, you have conflicting pieces of information given to you. The woman looks fine, but her eyes and, and, and mouth look very, very scary, right? If you were uh, a person who's uh, given this person in real life, you would be very scared, right? Because probably this person's going to eat you or kill you or something because she has a very malevolent sense on her face. And this is because our face, our, our eyes register the face as completely normal, uh, but the problem is that her mouth looks like it's, it's very abnormal and uh, because of these conflicting pieces of information we get uh, 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 quite a scare, right? And this is an image that works on all mammals because the, what we perceive at this level is actually part of our, of our core brain, very close to the place where the spinal cord meets our brain. So um, if you show this image, the upside down version of it to a dog, they'll be very fine. But if you flip it right side up as we just did, they might be very scared as well. Okay, and uh, this visual perception plays off in several other ways. So uh, we, we know of the fact that certain times when we see robots or animated film of people, 
especially ones that look quite like us. So here's an example of a robot Repli uh, Q2. This is a robot uh, in Japan. It's uh, fairly modern. And uh, she looks like an ordinary human being. But when you see robots move, of course, they're, they're very smooth in their actions, but um, in jerky in other ways. And the fact that they don't move according to our expectations of a, of a human throws us into a phenomenon which um, this uh, professor in uh, Japan, Mori, uh, has turned the uncanny valley, meaning that uh, we uh, have conflicting senses of information again. We perceive something as being human, but they don't act human, and it gets us very disgusted. So depth perception is something else that people do, and perceiving depth is actually based on a number of recognized cues that physiologists and psychologists know. And the primary ways that we perceive depth are actually based largely on the optic image received by our eyes. Okay, So the fact that we have two eyes, we can perceive stereoscopic vision, and the fact that we have muscle control. So when we are looking at things that are far and near, our eyes' muscles are positioned differently. When we're focused on something quite close, our eyes are typically uh, focusing our lens in such a way that we've uh, adapted and learned to know that that image is actually near us. And when we're looking at something far away, our muscles are more relaxed, our eyes contort back to their original shape, and we're looking at something in a far distance. Okay, But uh, many cases, we think of what's more important to HCI are the secondary cues that help us uh, illustrate depth. Okay, so because we are only looking at uh, things with one eye or we're not really building a computer system that is uh, a very large 3D system but something that might exist on a screen or a mobile phone, uh, uh, single images from one eye are enough there. So these types of secondary cues can be light and shadow they can be linear perspective, again, using the idea that we know what a 3D environment looks like. This is the same type of um, optical illusion that's illustrated by the Muller and Lyer arrows that you saw on the previous slide. And the fact that when you see motion, you see motion parallax. That means things in the front uh, that are close by move very quickly, and things in the distance uh, pretty much don't move at all. We see this a lot in use in games, where we have the foreground move a lot, and the background either not move at all or very, very slowly. And there's this notion of a texture gradient too, and this is what I'm showing you with the sand dunes on the right-hand side, is that up close we have a lot of texture, but as we move farther and farther into the distance, that uh, texture becomes much more smooth, right? So we perceive this as a 3D environment, although uh, you can see right here, it's just a flat image, okay? In window systems, we use overlap. We can use relative sizes of things front and near uh, and far and away uh, to indicate depth as well. Uh, and uh, that's not the only thing that we can study in perception. So there were a group of psychologists known as the Gestalts looking at perception of holes from parts because at the time when they were uh, working, there was a movement towards uh, deconstructing things into their component parts. So uh, these group of psychologists said, well, you know, parts, uh, understanding atomic parts are all fine and good, but uh, really we see things as a whole, and trying to understand how we perceive uh, holes from parts were part of their modus operandi, their working uh, theme. So, for example, when we put things together in close proximity to each other, we see them as a group. We see continuity in forms. We see similarity doing groups. So, for example, although all nine of these uh, shapes on this page are uh, probably equally close to each other, we actually perceive them as three groups, right? A group of triangles and two layers of circles. And that's just because of the similarity between these different shapes. And finally, closure, meaning in certain cases, even though we uh, are just white space intervening, we might compose a figure out of them. Okay, color perception is another important part. We saw that normally sighted people see in color, and that's true for the most part in uh, normal lighting, right? And this is because we basically have two different types of mechanisms for seeing 
light, right? One is rods, okay? These are neurons that are very, very highly sensitive. They help us see black and white. They can be fired with very little amount of energy, so very few photons being collected by a rod can already fire an electrical impulse into our brain. But they can't see color. They're a little too narrow to do that. And the cones that we have in our eyes, there's basically three different types that are sensitive to different wavelengths, help us perceive colors. But they need a lot more uh, photons to be hitting the eye to be fired. So we can really only see color in light, right? So if you have broad daylight, or uh, you'll be able to see color very vividly, but dark at late at night or in very dimly lighted scenes, our rods are active and our cones are not. Okay, so uh, actually the picture that you see in the inset is correct. So uh, we actually have our nerve fibers in the front, uh, closer to where the light is coming into our eyes. So the light comes into our eyes, it passes through the nerve fibers. Um, these are the fibers that are running, uh, that uh, will basically gather at this part where uh, the optic nerve starts and goes to our brain. And if it uh, penetrates through these nerve fibers, it hits the rods and cones, and these are the, the cells that generate the electrical impulses that go through our nerve fibers and then go through the optic nerve up here. Okay? And because the cones and rods are scattered differently, we have a lot more cones specific to color coming back to the back of the eye where the uh, lens focuses light for us. Okay, that's why we have to position our eyes in such a way that we can see what we're looking at. So when we're reading or we're looking at images, we refocus our uh, retina to expose that part of the retina to the part that we want to focus attention on so we can see color or detail very clearly. Okay, let's move to auditory perception. So auditory perception, again, means taking what we have in our echoic store, our echoic sensory store, and converting that into something of meaning, right? Words or sounds or recognition of something that we've heard before. And basically, when we hear sound, we hear the pressure that's being placed on to our eardrums, right? By vibrations in the air. And loudness is measured in terms of bells, okay? But bells are a very small unit of measure. So typically we use decibels, right, which are tens of bells, right? The bell scale that is used for measuring sound is actually logarithmic. They measure the loudness of how loud something gets. So 40 decibels is actually 10 times, it's a logarithmic 10 times louder than 30 decibels. Okay, so that's loudness. We have perceived loudness in this very uh, different uh, free, uh spectrum of measures so we can hear things up to let's say 120 decibels all the way down to 10 decibels that's uh, amazing uh, 12 magnitudes of difference in volume right in loudness okay but in terms of frequency pitches right we also have this ability to hear much better at lower pitches than higher pitches so uh, humans can hear pretty much from 100 hertz all the way up to 22 kilohertz. So that's, a, again, a very large range. The hertz range is not a logarithmic range, it's a linear range, okay? But when we talk about human voice, when we're talking to each other, pretty much we, our conversation goes from about 100 hertz to four kilohertz. That's our normal conversation voice. Humans can hear a much wider range than that. We hear up to 22 kilohertz, so much higher than that. So uh, when we play music or other things, we're using more of this dynamic range of pitch. And in fact, this is very much correlated to the way we construct our human computer interfaces for listening and reproducing audio. So for example, when you take a CD, uh, the CD is actually uh, sampling at a rate that's 44.1 kilohertz. And why exactly is that? It's because there's a law in physics that's due partially to Claude Shannon. This is the same Shannon as you, you know from information theory, the one that uh, created uh, uh, the basis for Fitt's law and uh, Hick Hyman's law. Okay, along with Nyquist, they uh, discovered a law that shows us that we need to sample 
at twice the frequency of a pitch to store it perfectly. So recall on the last slide, okay, that uh, humans can hear up to 22 kilohertz. So if you double this rate, that's 44k, right? 44k hertz. And we choose 44.1k because it's a power of 2, but otherwise the reason why we sample CDs at this rate is basically because that's the range, the, the dynamic range that humans can hear. Okay, finally we're going to cover just a, a momentary glance about haptics and uh, kinesthetics. Okay? Haptics refers to our sense of touch, whereas kinesthetics refers to our sense of body position and other pieces of information that we associate. So the temperature that we have, etc., all of those are our sense of our body's awareness. Right? Haptics just deals with touch. So force feedback, a force force feedback and vibration are haptic methods of perception, right? And there are newer methods of interaction. And um, as you may know, we are much more sensitive to sensations in the certain body parts that we have. So in fact, where is our most which organ do we have? Uh, which part of our skin organ do we have that has the most number of um, senses sensors? for touch. Okay? In fact, the answer to that is our back. We have to actually we have the most number of neurons that are connected to our sense of touch in our back. But it doesn't make a lot of sense. Do we actually feel a lot of things on our back? No, that's because those neurons are very well spread apart, right? Even though our fingertips are a very small area, they have a large, much larger concentration of nerves that are sensitive to touch. Okay, and this brings us to the end of our perception lecture, uh, which talks about the homunculus. The homunculus, this word in the bottom left, just means small man in Latin. And it's a way that we use a scale model to indicate which parts of our body are more sensitive in terms of sense or motor abilities. So on the left side of the screen, you see the sensory homunculus. Here, this figure is made in proportion to the amount of surface area that we are sensitive to. So you can see our lips, our tongues, our ears are quite sensitive, right? We can hear very well, we can see very well, and this is the amount, the surface area or the size of these organs are in proportion to the amount of space in our brain that we use to uh, process information from them. So for example, our hands are disproportionately large, right? This is because we place a lot of um, processing, cortical processing, cortex processing rather, to process information from our hands.